Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're grateful for this time that we have with you and your word, and we just confess that we're hungry for it. And it's amazing how um, your word has the ability to speak to us wherever we're at. And it just, with your Holy Spirit, just brings to the surface the things that we need to deal with or maybe turn over to you. And so, Lord, we just uh, open ourselves up to whatever you want to speak into our lives. We expect you to speak, and we're excited that you want to speak to us this morning. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, and all the people said, amen, amen. Okay, we're back in Romans. Uh, We titled this series, Romans, the Gospel of Grace. And we're in Romans chapter 6. So let's find our place to to Romans chapter 6. We're going to finish the chapter. Last week we started Romans chapter 6, and we kind of used Romans chapter 5, verse 20 as a springboard. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, um, where grace, rather, excuse me, I misquoted, where sin abounded, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Where, Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And we talked about how people have used that verse and twisted it to make it say something God never intended it. You know, people down through the ages has, have used that verse to, to kind of as an excuse to sin, as a license to sin. Grace, grace, God's grace. I can sin all I want because it's all covered by grace. And, and here's the thing. Grace is free. Thank God for that, but it's not cheap. And the bottom line is someone always has to pay the price. And what the gospel is all about is that Jesus got on the cross and he willingly took our sin and allowed our sin to kill him. And my question is, how can anyone have that attitude? Grace, grace, God's grace. I can sin all I want because it's covered by grace. How can you embrace the thing that you know put Jesus on the cross? And Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 6. He raises the question in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, certainly not. And I guess the classic illustration that I've used uh, several times over the years is a wedding ceremony. As a pastor, I have yet to do a wedding ceremony in which the, the, the groom pulls me off to the side and says, Hey, pastor. You need to answer me. Before I say I do to this woman, what can I get away with in this marriage and still keep the marriage legally intact? I mean, I have yet to do a wedding like that. In fact, if if anyone had that attitude, I would refuse to do it because the whole reason two people are getting married is so that they can be together, so that they can be one flesh, not so that one person can say, well, what, what can I get away with? And yet I feel like sometimes people do that with God. They say yes to Jesus Christ, and then they kind of ask, well, what can I get away with and still keep my salvation intact? And, of course, that question should never be asked because the goal as, as believers is to be one with Christ to the point that we think his thoughts right after him so that we become an extension of him. And that's what Paul is trying to get across here in Romans chapter 6. And it's interesting, we talked about this last week. He uses the image of baptism, how we have died in Christ. And baptism is a beautiful illustration. When we go down in the water, we we die to ourselves. In effect, we are crucified with Christ. And that completely destroys our relationship with sin because before we were slaves to sin. But when we're dead, hey, sin has no power over us, right? And when we rise up with Christ into newness of life, well, we're free to live the life God has called us to live. You see, a lot of people don't realize that on the cross, Jesus died to save us from the the, the penalty of sin, okay? We all seem to know that. He died to save us from the penalty of sin. But a lot of people don't realize that he also died to save us from the power of sin. And that's huge. He saved us from the power of sin. In other words, sin has no more dominion over us. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, why do I continue to sin? Well, the fact of the matter is you and I will struggle with sin until the day we die. In fact, the only people who don't struggle are people who give in to sin, right? We will struggle with sin. But here's the thing. 
We are no longer slaves of sin. Before, we could do nothing but sin. I mean, I mean, if we weren't slaves to sin, why in the world would God send his son to die for us if we can beat sin on our own? No, we were absolutely, totally slaves to sin. That's all we could. That's why God sent his son, so that we would die with him and die to sin so that we could be risen up into newness of life. And the rest of the time we had last week, we talked about practical ways that we can overcome sin, not in ourselves, that's very important to understand, but in Christ. And uh, we talked about how it begins with how you focus. See, a lot of people, truth is, they try to beat sin in their own strength, in their own power, and and they're like, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And that never works because whatever you focus on, whatever you you say, I'm not going to do it, you bring closer into your life. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous knows this all too well. The way to beat alcoholism is not to say, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, because every time you think that, you're trying to beat it on your own, and you're bringing that drink one step closer to you. I mean, the answer is to shift your focus off that drink and on to the one who can deliver you. And I don't know if I have my words exactly right, but one of the principles of AA is that we acknowledge that we are totally helpless to overcome alcohol in and of ourselves. And they look to, and this used to bug me, they, they, they look to a higher power who can help them. Until it was explained to me that at least in this chapter in Medina, that higher power has a very specific name, Jesus Christ. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one we need to look to. And as we focus on him, it's amazing how much strength he gives us. And then we kind of ended last week talking about how there is a conflict going on. Paul talks about Romans chapter in terms of a, a struggle with the, the old man, he calls it, and the new man. The old man, who we were in Christ, and the new man, who we are. Uh, is this thing cutting out? I think it is. Let me see if I can fix that. Maybe I just need to hold it right. Um, Galatians 5 talks about this conflict with our, with our spirit and the flesh. And you, and you can think of it as two wolves. Remember we talked about this? Uh, fighting a black wolf, the flesh, and the white wolf, the, the spirit. And which one wins? Whichever one you feed, right? And the goal is to starve the flesh and feed the spirit. And we ended last week talking about various ways that we feed our spirit. And if you missed last week, you can look that up and, and get caught up on that message. But this morning, I want to take off on verse 15 of chapter 6. And if you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 15, he asks a very similar question that he asked earlier in verse 1. Look at verse 15. Paul says this, what then shall we sin because we're, we are not under the law, but under grace? And his answer is certainly not. And again, how can you embrace something you know put Jesus on the cross? And then he says this. Look at verse 16. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? You know, the fact of the matter is um, whatever you give yourself to, And this is one of the principles of the spiritual universe. Whatever you give yourself to, that you become a slave to. I mean, think about it for a moment. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that you can't serve two masters. Whatever you give yourself to. Uh, In Sunday school, we were talking about the rich young ruler. Remember him? And Jesus said, one thing you lack, go sell sell everything you have and come follow me. And he wasn't willing to give it up. And he walked away sadly because he had many possessions. In other words, that rich young ruler, his wealth had a hold of him. His wealth, he became a slave to his wealth. And here's the bottom line. Slavery is obedience. And you might be asking, what in the world are you getting at? Look at verse 16 again and notice the word obey. Paul says, do you not know that to whom you present yourself, here it is, slaves to obey... You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. I mean, you are a slave to something. You're going to either be a slave to sin or you're going to be a slave to God. And he goes on to say, verse 17, but God be thanked that though you, notice past tense, were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. 
Verse 18, and having been, again, past tense, set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. In verse 9, he goes on to say, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For <laughs> because of the, I'm reminded of what Peter wrote about Paul. Some of the things Paul writes about are difficult to understand, and, and it's like uh, Paul is saying, hey, I'm going to dumb this down to you. He says, I speak to you in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, that's not dumbed down enough. I still don't get it. Well, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, basically, remember when you, before you came to Christ, how you presented your members to sin? Yeah. What Paul is saying, you do that now to God. That's what he's saying, basically. And, and, and it's this idea that, you know, my mind, I used to think, I don't know about you, I used to have very selfish thoughts. It became all about me. Life became all about me. And as I came to Christ, there was this paradigm shift. And I'm not saying that I'm always there, but, but there, there was this shift on the way, it changed the way I thought. I began to not so much think about myself, but to think about God. And, and Lord, here is my mind. I want to think your thoughts right after you. Do you see the, the paradigm shift? Here are my eyes. I want to see the world through your eyes. Here are my ears. I want to hear the world through your ears. Here's my heart, Lord. It used to just beat for me. I want it to beat after your heart. Here are my hands. That's what Paul is saying. Just as we once presented our members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, now present your members to God. That's what he's saying, in effect. And he goes on to say, look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now, there's another spiritual principle that he touches on here in verse 20, and he really gets into in verse 23. And that spiritual principle is this. Sin always leads to death. Always. Even for the believer. Now, for the believer, it does not result in eternal death. Thank God for that. But sin, nevertheless, always destroys and kills everything it touches. And I've seen it happen in my own life as a believer, as well as in the lives around me, and I'm sure you have as well. I've seen a lot of relationships destroyed because of sin. I've seen a lot of marriages get destroyed because once trust is lost, well, it's almost impossible to rebuild. I've seen people's jobs or careers destroyed because of sin. I've seen their hopes and dreams dashed because of sin. Sin always kills, period. It's a, it's a spiritual truth of the universe. And then he goes on to say this. Look at verse 22. But now we have been set free from sin and having become slaves of God. Note that, slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 23 is a memory verse to a lot of you. In fact, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know probably about maybe half of you know this verse. The wages of sin is death, but I'm going to point to Emmett. Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. It's a great verse to memorize. And here's why I love this verse. You have both bad news and good news. The wages of sin is death. That's bad news. But transition word, it's an awesome word, B-U-T, but the gift of God, some translations say the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But I want to come back to verse 20. It says that we, were, we are slaves of God. Did you know one of Paul's favorite ways to refer to himself was a bondservant of Christ? In fact, he does so in, in Romans chapter 1. He introdu introduces himself as Paul, a bondservant of Christ. That word servant is doulos in the Greek. It's slave, literally, bond slave. And we talked about what a bond slave is. Back in the ancient days, about half of the Roman Empire were slaves. 
And, and back then, if you got yourself into debt, you couldn't declare bankruptcy. That debt had to be repaid. And more often than not, that would mean that you would sell yourself literally into slavery until that debt was repaid. But there were occasions after you worked that debt off, after you regained your freedom, there would be cases in which a person did not want to leave the service of the master because he was a good master. Sound familiar? In which case, the master would take him back as a bond slave, meaning a slave that has regained his freedom only to choose to give it up again to remain in the service of the master. That's Paul's favorite term. I've been set free by God's grace, but Lord, I, I want to give myself. I want to become your slave. I want to be a bond slave of Christ. And that ought to be our goal as well. But when I think of chapter 6 as a whole, here's what, here's what Paul is trying to get across. And I shared this maybe about 10 years ago from a professor that, that is still one of my heroes today. His name uh, is Dr. John Oswalt. He uh, teaches at Asbury, uh, one of the, if not the greatest seminary. They teach the Word of God. I mean, I love it. Um, he, he teaches Old Testament. This guy was actually one of the translators on the original NIV and here more recently, the New Living Translation. Just a brilliant guy. And, and he had a way of telling stories, and he told a fairy tale. And I'll never forget it when he, when, when he told it. He said, imagine a prince, and he's riding around town. And he sees, and, and his exact words were, were this, he sees sitting on a street corner, a whore. Now, don't let that offend you. It appears in the Bible, okay, the word whore, but that's what she was. She's sitting on the corner. Her legs are slightly apart. Her, her skin is caked with dirt. She's, she's stringy and greasy, and there's a stench about her, and she's chewing on something, probably tobacco. We don't want to know what it is, and she's just looking nasty. And this prince says, stop the carriage, stop the carriage. I found the woman I want to marry. And everyone's around like, are, are you sure? <laughs> really? And the prince is like, can't you see? Can't you see she's the one? Doesn't matter what you think, she's the one. Let's take her to the palace and get her ready for the wedding. And they take her to the palace and get her ready for the wedding. And the day of the wedding finally comes. And they bring in all these young women, all these beautiful things, you know, a tray of soap, a tray of perfume, this beautiful wedding dress. And there she is sitting just like she was on the street corner. And they're like, don't you want to get ready for your wedding? And she's like, well, he liked me when I was filthy and greasy. He can take me that way. You see, that's the person who would say, grace, grace, God's grace. I can sin all I want. It's covered by grace. But is that really what she's going to say? No, nah, she's going to look at the tray of perfume, the tray of soap, and she's going to think, okay, soap, there has to be a bath somewhere. I can't remember the last time I've had a bath. I'm taking a bath. I hope you got some heavy-duty soap with some sand in it like lava. I want to get this stuff off of me. And she's going to take a bath for hours. She's going to use up every soap on that tray. And when she finally gets out, she's going to look at the perfume and sample some. And, oh, that smells beautiful. And this is what she keeps saying over and over again. It's beautiful, but do you think you can find something even more beautiful? I can't understand what the prince saw in me, but I want to be the best I can be for him. And she's going to look at the wedding dress, and she's going to gasp. I've never seen a dress so beautiful. But do you think he could find a dress even more beautiful? Again, I can't understand what the prince saw in me, but I want to be the best I can be for him. You see, that is the healthy way to respond to God's grace. Because I don't care who you are, every single one of us at one time was that whore sitting on the street corner. We had nothing in and of ourselves to offer a God so holy. And yet somehow he chose us. And listen, we'll be spending the rest of eternity trying to figure that out. I don't think we ever will. 
But responding to grace in the way that the Bible outlines it is not saying, grace, grace, I can sin all I want. It's having the opposite. I don't understand what Jesus saw in me, but I want to be everything I can be for him. So let me go ahead and ask the question, and we'll put chapter 6 to bed. Shall we sin that grace may abound? <laughs> King James, God forbid. New King James, certainly not. We want to be the best we can be for him. Amen? Let's stand up and we'll pray. So, Father, we are graceful, grateful for your grace. And, and, Lord, if we're waiting to understand how you can choose us, we're going to wait a whole long time. We just want to be people who are grateful. Lord, there's no way we can earn your favor, but the good news is we don't have to. It's already given. And all we can do is respond to it. And, Lord, we want to respond by saying, I don't understand, Lord, what you saw in me, but as God is my witness, I want to be the best I can be for you. And I don't know where you are this morning in, in your prayer time with the Lord. Maybe there's someone here this morning that needs to hear that. Maybe you've been trying to earn your way to God and you just need to say, hey, I can't earn it, but you know what? I'm going to respond to it. Maybe there are others that have made it so difficult that you haven't even tried to come to the Lord. Maybe there are others that have kind of used grace as a, well, it's all covered. Holy Spirit, would you give us what we need to hear? Would you show us how we need to respond? And we're so grateful that your word, your word says that you are faithful to complete what you started in each of our lives. So, Lord, we surrender to you and we pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. Okay, we're going to sing, There's a Song in My Soul. And uh, Cody Stegmiller is going to come up and lead this for us.